All right. Welcome back to the Shields on Hoops podcast. I'm back here with Nick Peckham. Just had a little one, right? So he's doing the uh, the late night shifts and the feeding and all the fun stuff that comes along with that. Um, glad to have him back, though, for this. Uh, we're going to kind of do a BC recap and a UNC preview. I know BC was a couple nights ago, uh, but it's a nine o'clock tip and I got stuff to do the next morning. So um, I just haven't had time to get back to the BC stuff. Posted a couple of things on on Twitter, X, whatever we're calling that now. But um, Syracuse had a nice 10-point win. I mean, a win is a win. Uh, that was a fairly matched Ken Palm slash analytical team. So to create some space there was nice for Syracuse. Uh, jumped out to a nice nice lead early. Uh, kind of stopped forcing turnovers um, there in the second half. BC came back, and then Syracuse kind of responded with, with some big buckets when they finally put Chris Bell back in the game. Um, with his plus 28 plus minus last <laughs> last time out. So good to see Bell hit some shots. Good to see Taylor hit some shots early, although you know he kind of cooled off. But it was good to see both of them kind of get going early, kind of set the tone for the rest of the game. Um, we were talking earlier about the defensive intensity was tuned in to start. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, I think it's just obvious. It's blatantly obvious at this point the guys who kind of need to be on the floor uh, they've kind of naturally just made that happen. And now with Nahima Cloud out, it kind of shortens the rotation a little bit even more to kind of what people were honestly not hoping he was hurt, but like hoping the rotation would kind of like shorten down to. Um, when injury gives you no choice, you kind of just roll with it. So uh, Syracuse 11 and 4, 2 and 2 in the conference. Uh, they're heading to undefeated ACC opponent unc unc's 12 and 3 on the year but they haven't lost in the acc uh top 10 ken palm team um a uh, top uh 10 defense top 15 offense in the country so a really legit test to le two legitimate probably all american type players on the roster uh with some good surrounding pieces and a lot of experience right they got a lot of experience and a, a pretty good freshman as well but um yeah, so that's kind of the basic on Carolina. Uh, Nick, I'll let you kind of dive in here. Let's start with BC. What were your kind of initial thoughts um, in addition to what I was kind of saying? And uh, kind of just take us from there. Yeah, I thought um, at the start of the game, Syracuse came out and the defensive intensity was there. Um, they were jumping passing lanes. They were getting after it defensively. They were um, mixing it up on the boards. They were – they kind of gave themselves um, opportunities, like you mentioned, to kind of get in transition. Where in the second half, that kind of stopped because BC started making shots and it became a half court game. Mm -hmm. But not playing for, I think it was eight days. Um, Syracuse kind of, you kind of had a feeling that Syracuse would come out offensively a little bit rusty. Um, their last game was at Duke, and the second half kind of Duke kind of stabbed him in the heart, and it was over after that. So. It, yeah, um, it was nice to see him come out and have that defensive intensity um, at home. Uh, the, it was one of those games where you kind of have to win. Uh, you're at home. You're coming off that loss. You don't really want to fall to, what, one and three in the ACC at that point. So it was kind of one of those games where you kind of had to have. And Syracuse came out with that mentality. Um, I know, obviously, we didn't know anything until uh, a half hour before tip. But obviously, Nahima Cloud didn't play in Judah Mintz. Uh, did not start. He came off the bench. So it was kind of one of those games where I look at it and just like like I mentioned, I uh, I coached at Liverpool on the freshman basketball team. And sometimes you have those games where things just don't feel right. And all you kind of want to do is get out of there with a W. And that's kind of how it felt uh, against BC. It was a 9 p.m. tip. Uh, obviously, no students are back yet. They're all still on Christmas break. Uh, and just, just kind of things like that kind of felt like a little dull. Um, but Syracuse, like you mentioned, they jumped out early. They kind of – BC kind of came back, took a one-point lead, and then Syracuse ran away at the end and got a 10-point win. So um, impress, impressive to see them kind of get punched back and kind of punch back again to stretch that lead at the end. Uh, Malik Brown and Quadir Copeland were fantastic in that game. Uh, Chris Bell was also fantastic. I know I texted you before the game, and I said – I, I kind of had a feeling that Chris and Justin maybe might get it going. Uh, Chris definitely did. Uh, Justin, not so much. But to see Chris kind of jump passing lanes, I think he had three transition dunks in that game. Um, yeah. Just the little things like that that you wouldn't have seen from Chris last year. 
Uh, there was one he got a steal where he came down and he did like a, a little windmill and threw it down. And like, that's the Chris Bell we need, right? Um, I mean, I, I don't know how many of you watch the Eric Devendorf and Chris Joseph show on Q Sports Talk every Wednesday, but uh, they were actually talking about it with, I forgot who, I think it was uh, the assistant coach Alan Griffin was on, but they were talking about how Chris Bell kind of seems like the one prototypical NBA player on the roster right now, like with his size, his length, his athleticism, the way he shoots the ball. Um, I don't know if, if many of you watch it, but if Chris Bell gets his feet set, the odds of the shot going in are probably closer to 90% yes and 10% no, where when he's kind of off balance, it seems like he doesn't know how to shoot the ball. So if he ever gets his feet set, just, just know that it's most likely going in. Um, but that's the Chris Bell we need moving forward, especially like you mentioned without Naheem. Um, it kind of seems like the rotation's kind of shortening a little bit, like you mentioned. And now uh, with Malik probably starting at the five for the f uh, foreseeable future, because nobody really knows how long Naheem's out for, um, it kind of seems like the guys off the bench that are really going to play a bunch of minutes are probably down to Quadir and maybe Benny. Um, Kyle will be one of those situational guys that probably won't see the floor unless JJ or Judah are in fall trouble or they need a, a little breather. Um, and Hemum is probably one of those guys who's uh, pick and play. I know against BC, he kind of played in the first half. He played in the first half a little bit and then didn't touch the floor in the second half. So we'll kind of see how that goes. Um, but an impressive win, nonetheless. Uh, they got the W and now it's time to go on the road. Uh, like you mentioned, against one of the or the best team right now in the ACC. Um, and the last three or four games that North Carolina has played, they're like, I think their opponents are averaging under like 57 points a game. So, and those have all been road games, by the way. Yes. Which and now crazy. they're back in the, now they're back at Chapel Hill. So, this is crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, just to add on a little bit about uh, Boston, uh, you know, so Malik Brown ends up with 19 and eight and four assists and four blocks and four – like, like what? Like, what's going on? Like, 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 19 points, eight rebounds, four assists, four blocks, four steals, zero turnovers. Like, just in 34 minutes. I mean, like, just – A lot of his points were when the game was tight – It'd be uh, Quadir and Malik pick and roll, and Quadir would make these passes that I never thought I'd see Quadir make. Some of them where he threaded the needle down low, and Malik finished. And, and that was one thing that we've talked about all year. Um, obviously, in the beginning of the year, a big thing that we mentioned was Malik kind of um, finishing softly around the rim. Like, it was a lot of layups and things like that. Well, this, this game – Malik went in aggressive and he went to dunk it and he didn't care who was in his way. Yeah, just dunk it. Yep. That's the way to go. Just try and dunk everything. Um yeah, I mean him and him and Quadier are playing really well together. They I I mean, I I don't have this stat or I don't know how to even get this stat, but I I'm be very curious to the amount of, of uh Quadier's assists that come from uh <laughs> going to, to Malik, right? So um uh, yeah, so it's Taylor, uh, seven points. He was one for five from three, two for six. I mean, he took 11 shots. Uh, I like the aggressiveness. I don't love the aggressiveness, but, but a um, lot of his shots were, yeah, like way too early. He's, he's, I, I like the, I like the takes, uh, I like a couple takes to the rim. I like, um, catch and shoot rhythm threes. I don't love the step backs and the spin move things that's going on. That's just not a high percentage shot for him. Um, seven rebounds, eight, eight, eight uh, an, an assist and a steal, two turnovers. Uh, Chris Bell had his best game in about, I don't know, a month, I guess, probably. Um, maybe three weeks. He had 20 points in 27 minutes. Somehow, Justin Taylor played more than Chris Bell in this game. I don't know how. Uh, but four for nine from three, four for five from two. Had, like you said, had a bunch of steals. Made some big plays. Uh, Quadier was good as well. Seven points, six rebounds, four assists. Uh, no turnovers for Quadir in this one. Syracuse as a team only had eight, which is fantastic, especially when you compare it to Boston's 22. So uh, JJ was pretty non-existent, 24 minutes. I, I can't remember a time, the last time he played that few minutes. He's usually up in that 30, 32 range. Uh, but he was one for three from the field, had four rebounds and an assist, and just kind of, he just kind of was out, just was kind of out there. 
Uh, Judah, like we said, came off the bench, played 31, got to the foul line a lot. Uh, seven of his 10 points were from the foul line. He was 0 for 6 from 2. So it's funny. So uh, you mentioned Judah played 31 minutes. And if any of you remember, Judah came in at the – I think he he set out the first nine minutes and 14 seconds of the game. So when he yeah. came in, he did not leave the floor again. Yeah. I and mean, then, yeah. And again, he just had a, a basic game. Uh, and then he only, I, go ahead. Oh, no. And I mentioned it kind of seemed like Judah was not really in the flow of the game. I mean, obviously, he came in with like yeah. 11 minutes, just under 11 minutes left in the first half. And then halftime came. And then he had to try to get warm back up again. And, um, that's just one thing that when you're kind of a starter, you kind of feel your way into the game and that first four or five minutes, you're kind of getting a feel for it. Uh, when Judah came in, Syracuse was already up big. So Judah kind of sat back and let the guys that were out there playing kind of play. So, yeah. um, but to, I will say one thing before you go on to Benny and uh, the rest of the bench, but I will say one thing that uh, to score, I think they ended up scoring 69 points and to um, kind of have J.J. and Judah kind of, like you mentioned, being non-existent and still kind of pull away at the end and things like that. Um, very impressive from the others on this team because obviously the others on this team are going to take Syracuse as far as Syracuse can go. You on Most nights you're not going to have 12 points between Judah and J.J. So to see like the other guys step up and get the 19 from Malik and the 20 from Chris Bell, the – um, extra from Quadir and the extra from Justin and things like that. That's only going to help this team moving forward. It was certainly important that uh, Chris Bell kind of stepped up uh, in this game. I mean, I think I know he gets a lot of flack, but and obviously Malik was the the best player in this game. But I mean, hit Chris Bell's play has. I I, I don't know if we beat BC if he doesn't play well. I know we don't beat Colgate if he doesn't play well. So I, I feel like he's been – he's a big part of when Syracuse wins, right? Like Syracuse can't beat Carolina if Chris Bell doesn't play well. They the one thing the one Euro thing Syracuse. I want to see and Euro as Syracuse. the next step to Chris Bell, because obviously we've talked. We've seen a lot of improvement in certain areas this year. Um, every game you kind of see something different. The next step for me, um, I don't know, I, I, obviously watching a lot of Syracuse basketball is consistency, right? Like the yeah. next step for me is him doing it. And I'm not saying the getting steals and getting windmills and things like that, just the play on the court, the aggressiveness and things like that. Like use that. You, Chris Bell is one of those players. And I think they kind of mention it on the, like if you w watch the game and the commentators, um, when Chris Bell, he hit his first three and his first three went down. And then it kind of, you kind of saw him like get the jitters out of his body and his aggressiveness on defense started getting more intense. So like he's a player yeah. that, if he scores on offense, he's going to bring you more things on the floor. Now, what happens when you don't, when your shot's not falling or you don't get the looks that you may get in a game like this? How do you play? Like, that's what I want to see next from Chris Bell is just the consistency. Because, like I said, I think, I, I mean, I know you kind of look at the guards, right, as being like the two guys that are going to carry this team. But I think yeah. Chris Bell is just as important as Judah or JJ. Yeah. They're just, yeah, just in a different way. I mean, yeah. like, and, you know, speaking of consistency, I I would like to see Copeland play well against somebody that's good. Like, you know what I mean? Like, Quadir does well against like like opponents and teams that are a little bit worse than Syracuse. I haven't seen him play well against a Duke or a Carolina or a UVA. Like, think about it. You know what I mean? Like, he was pretty bad against Duke. He was pretty bad against UVA. So, like, I, I guess, and I mean, I don't know. I guess we can count Oregon, but um, he's been well. He'd play well against Oregon. As, as a good team, I guess he played well against uh, Georgetown. They're not good. Right. And he's played well kind of in that stretch of the, where the schedule is kind of soft. He has not played well against like the upper echelon. At, and I don't even know if we consider UVA upper echelon anymore. They're struggling too. So I'd like to see him play well in a game that like has a, an actual legitimately good opponent. I'd like to see that for him as far as his consistency goes. I would like to see, like you mentioned, like I know, uh, the way he played against, and I know Pitt, Pitt's not a high-level team, but yeah. the way he played defensively on Blake Hinson um, kind of throughout that game, that's what I want to see, like you mentioned, against these bigger opponents. Like, you kind of took out one of the best players in the ACC defensively 
because of how you played and your aggression uh, aggressiveness and things like that. So like, yeah. Um, and one thing I will say, um, I don't want to get too much into it, obviously, but the one thing I will say is um, I talk to a lot of Syracuse fans. Obviously, I live in Syracuse, so everybody I talk to is a Syracuse fan. Um, but the one thing that people keep saying that I keep hearing is we played a bunch of good opponents early. Like, obviously, we played Tennessee. We played Gonzaga. We played – at the time, we played the UVA. They were better. I don't know. What I don't happened. know. Gonzaga is like a – Gonzaga is like 50-some, right? Well, they're 20-some in Ken Palma there. They're they just lost too. to Santa Clara, I think, yeah. last night. Or, yeah, they're yeah they're they're struggling too. So, um, and Duke, when is this team like you've played these big games, you've played on the road now? So when does this all come together? Like, is this the game North Carolina where you kind of take that next step to where it's competitive, right? Like, I want to see Syracuse in a close game on the road against a big time opponent yeah. with five minutes to go, and I want to see how we play. Like, what? What, what do we go to? Like, what is our go-to plays? Who kind of steps up? Like, that's what I really want to see. Um, yeah. And obviously, North Carolina is playing at a very, very high level right now uh, compared yeah. to anybody else in the ACC. But um, I think this is going to be a good test. Um, obviously, we have, we're have we at North Carolina, and then we're at Pitt, and then we have three straight home games. So, like, this is kind yeah. of a stretch here where if you're Syracuse, if you can get one of these two on the road um, and then you come home, you have a chance to kind of separate yourself in the from the bottom of the ACC up into the middle of the ACC. So let's see what happens. Um, yeah. But yeah. I don't – I mean, I, I don't – I personally, I mean, I don't see them winning either of these next two games, um, and I don't think that's too terrible of a thing. Um, I don't think they're supposed to win either of these games. The, the pit game might be like pit by one or two probably when it comes down to Vegas. Um, Ken Palm Pitt winning 74-69. Yeah, and Carolina, I think, is 12 and a half right now, or last uh, I looked. But. Uh, Carolina is – on Ken Palm, it's 14. Yeah, or it's they have Carolina right. winning by 14. Yeah. Um, this is – based on Ken Palm, this is Syracuse's least likely win for the rest of the season. Um, but, yeah, you're right. That, that Miami at home, that Florida State at home, that NC State at home um, is a really – Big home stretch for Syracuse, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a, a little bit later, maybe. Um, let's move to Carolina a little bit. So, as mentioned before, Carolina's pretty solid. Uh, I mean, UNC leads the series sixteen to six. Um, they Syracuse has kind of played decent against them. Um, my favorite Syracuse memory is the the pre COVID shutdown, just beat down. In the ACC tournament. Uh, that's my favorite Carolina memory. Oh, I'll never forget um, that. That's because I, I remember being remember at B. I was at B Dubs, man, watching it. I was like, "This is awesome!" Like we, we're we're figuring it out. And then they're like, uh, "Well, the whole year's canceled." Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's when um, Cole Anthony was the point guard on North Carolina, and I think they they either came to the I think they came to the dome earlier that year and they hit like they dropped like a hundred on us or something like that. They hit a crazy amount of threes. Mm -hmm. And then we got our get back, obviously, like you said, in the ACC tournament where it was a, I, from tip, it was a beat down. And I was like, wow, this could be a year that we make noise in the ACC tournament. I feel like we're really coming yeah, along. Finally, finally, and then maybe, 10 maybe minutes finally. after the game ended, they mentioned that everything was getting shut down. Yeah, that was weird. I was, I remember being at, I was at B-dubs and I was like, this is okay. Well, all right then. This is fun. This was fun. Um, at least, at least got to end the year on a good note. Um, so last year, uh, you know, Carolina and Syracuse went down to the wire in the dome. Uh, Chris Bell played really well in that one as well. Uh, came down to that, a Judah Mintz yeah, that, charge. Yeah, that controversial kind of play. Um, also, um, on the inbounds and, and Syracuse lost that one. Uh, Carolina's last three have all been road ACC wins. They beat NC State by 13, beat Clemson by 10, and beat Pitt by 13 on the road. So they'll be coming home after that. If you look at the rankings, right, like if you average out the four rankings I use, uh, Syracuse is like at 71.75 in the country, and Carolina is at 10. Obviously, they feature R.J. Davis and Armando Baycott. You know, Baycott's averaging a double-double. He's like 27 years old. Um, R.J. Davis is a 39, almost 40% three-point shooter. Um, really <laughs> solid guard. Uh, Harrison Ingram is shooting 42% for them. Cormac Ryan is shooting a lot for them, but he's only shooting 28.9%. We know what that means. He's, uh, a, he's man, in a struggle bus. But man, listen, like 
RJ Davis is 58 for six, 58 for 61 from the foul line for 95.1% on the year. And Cormac Ryan is 31 for 34 for 91.2. So their guards are, are shooting well outside of Cadeau, Cadu, whatever you, however you say his name. Um, he's not really a shooter. He's more of a driver and an assist guy. And um, they also have Seth Trimble, Jalen Withers, and the Paxson guy who I don't know how to say his last name. So the thing about Carolina is, yeah, something like that. Um, the thing about Carolina is you got senior, junior, grad, grad, freshman, sophomore, grad, grad. So they got a lot of experience, a lot of age, some guys who have played for different really good coaches. Um, and that's, I think that's kind of the difference in them this year and last year. It's a pretty mature team, man. Like when I watch them play, that's like kind of been my vibe. Uh, they're pretty mature. And I, I it's, I mean, it's going to be Carolina or Duke in the ACC when it's all said and done, probably. I thought Clemson might challenge, but they are just, yeah, they can't, they have not been able to get it done lately. Um, so the, the big stats for Carolina um, again, 14th most efficient offense in the country. And this is the alarming one that kind of scares me is that they have the eighth best defense in the country. So when Syracuse brings their 143rd ranked offense into this game, you know, it, it's – and, again, Carolina takes care of the ball. They're top 20 in that. But Syracuse just keeps turning teams over that take care of the ball. Like, Pitt is a non-turnover team. Turned them over. BC was number 11 in the country, 22. Like, like, like so Syracuse is being very disruptive in passing lanes. Um, but, again, they have not done that against the Dukes, the UVAs, the Gonzagas the Tennessees, right? And not not a lot of teams do, but that's kind of been their bread and butter. Like when the offense has been good, it's been, it's been because the defense has kind of forced turnovers and got some easy points. When teams have taken care of the ball and forced Syracuse to play in the half court offensively, it, it's just struggle bus. They probably, Syracuse probably, I think, has the third worst offense in the ACC right now. Um, and, you know, the two bad teams in the ACC are pretty bad, right? I mean, it's Notre Dame and Louisville. Like, those are the only two teams that Syracuse has a better offense than um, right now. So those are kind of my concerns going in. Like, can Syracuse keep turning teams over? Uh, can they play well on the big stage? Um, and obviously, mm-hmm. how do we handle Baycott, right? Like, I feel like Syracuse has done good with, like, big guys for yeah. some reason. Like, Will Baker struggled. It's weird. It's weird. Quentin, but Baycott is the first banger they're playing, though. And But you saw, also saw what McLaughlin did, right? Like, McLaughlin's kind of a, a physical guy for BC. He had his way. So I'm very curious to see Baycott, who's a lot more physical and experienced and not really – he's not going to be out on the elbow and, like, he's not going to be out of the three-point line catching things. He's going to be, like, banging the entire game. So I'm interested to see what that looks like and if Syracuse does anything different. Um, and yeah, that, those are kind of my first kind of initial thoughts when I think about Carolina. Um, yeah, I think I the one thing that. that Syracuse kind of has to do, um, is obviously with Malik playing the five, um, you're going to, I mean, you, you, the, the one thing that offensively is you're going to have to attack Armando Baycott. He he's been this year, he's been prone to picking up falls early in games, um, I know, like, NC State, he picked up two very early and sat, like, the entire first half. Um, so, like, that's what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to kind of go at – because, like, their backup big, Jalen Washington, doesn't scare you as much as Armando Baycott does. So, yeah. like, you're going to have to go at him. Um, I will say the the one big matchup that I'm looking f- at um, in this game is the guard, the guards for both teams. Obviously, you have – R.J. Davis, who's um, playing at an all-American level right now. Uh, he's, like, one of the best players in college basketball. I watched him against NC State, and he made big shot after big shot after big shot in that game. Um, and then you have the number one uh, pure point guard passer uh, that came into college this year in Elliott Cadeau. Um, he was, like, top three point guard in the country. He was, the like, analytics-wise, when you look at, like, pure point guards, like passing and things like that. He was the number one guy. Uh, He didn't start the season. Seth Trimble did. Um, I think recently they kind of made that switch where Seth Seth Trimble's kind of coming off the bench now. Um, Yeah, I know Kudos playing more. I know that much. 
Yeah, but that those two and JJ and Judah, I think it's going to be a huge matchup. Kind of who plays better out of that duo, um, and with JJ and Judah, kind of like you mentioned, being non-existent against Boston College, it's like, all right, now we need you. Like you guys had your game where you didn't yeah. play good. Everybody else stepped up. They got you the W. Like now we need you. Look, I'd like to see Judah have a good game against a good team. Like, if we're talking real, like, like where he doesn't like just shoot or or sc- hit like six free throws in garbage time to get eighteen points. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, right, I'd like listen, to see I'm him. Not, I want to see like JJ to see, put a game together, a full game. I'd like to. I'd like to see Judah play like an NBA player that everybody says he is against NBA competition. Like you know what I mean? Like, cause everybody's like, "Oh, Judah's on the draft board. Oh, he's up to like thirty five, or he's at forty two. I don't care where Judah is. Show me like, that. I you don't, can, yeah, I don't give a crap. Like, and, and maybe he, play and, against good competition in college. Yeah, and, and maybe he, maybe his game's more better adjust for the NBA and the spacing. I, I don't care. But like the point being, I what is Judah's like signature game? Does he you have came one? Back, right? You came back to Syracuse because you quote-unquote, had unfinished business and you guys missed the tournament last year, the, a game like tomorrow or a game like at, and at North Carolina is a game that you win and it takes you a long way. You had a chance last year to beat North Carolina in the Dome and it came down to a block charge call on you. And, like, this is what I'm saying. Like, this is what you can't – like, the, if, if Syracuse is going to get back to what we used to be, and you want these recruits to come here. Games like this are games that guys watch. You're on ESPN at noon on a Saturday. Like the world's going to be tuned in. 100%. And you came back to Syracuse, right? Because you went through the NBA draft and they told you things that you needed to work on to become an NBA player. Now, yes, some of these things maybe you've worked on, like getting to the free throw line or hitting threes. But like you've mentioned, your threes are now coming back to earth. So, Mm -hmm. like, now it's at a point now where you had a horrible game. You sat the first nine minutes of the game because of team violation or team rule violation, and Adrian Autry was sending a message. Now it's time for you to be the leader on this team that everybody says you are and step the fuck up. Sorry for my language, but you step up. Let's let's look. All right, I'm going to go real quick and look at Judah Mintz's like. let, Let me ask you something while you look that up. If you're the coaching staff of this team, do you double Armando Baker on the catch or do you let him play one-on-one with Malik? Uh, Since we never double and you have two two or three days of practice, I don't know what they'll do. I mean, I think they have too much around them. Like Carolina has a lot more around them. The one guy that I would let shoot threes is Elliot Cadeau. Because he's yeah. not – that's not his strength. But, like, I'm not leaving RJ open. I'm not leaving Cormac Ryan. Even though, he, like you said, he's shooting 28% and he's on a struggle bus. doesn't matter. He's seen yeah. Syracuse enough over his five years to know how to play against Syracuse. Well, he's good enough of a shooter to where he'll eventually start making shots. Like, we talk yeah. about reverting to the mean all the time. It'll be the same thing for him. All right, so Judah Mintz last year, big game at Illinois. Had a dunk. Three for 16. Four turnovers. Nine Stop. points. Stop with okay. the head of dunk. I don't care about the dunk. <laughs> at UVA, played well last year at UVA. Seven for 14, uh, four turnovers, 18 points. Okay. At Miami last year, one for seven, five turnovers, three points. Uh, and Here. one of those five one of those five turnovers was, uh-huh. I th- I'm pretty sure we were down one or we were tied, and it was like the last minute and a half of the game, and he drove to the rim and turned it over. Carolina last year, 17 points, three turnovers, 17 points on 19 shots. Uh, who else? Do By the way, like you mentioned, they don't – Syracuse doesn't have a chance in that game against North Carolina at the Dome without Chris Bell. I think that was Chris Bell's best game as a freshman. Yeah. And, again, not, again, not over here trying to pick on, on Mintz, but, like, I, the point being – like I just want to see him actually lead Syracuse to an actual victory that actually matters. And go again, and I hate to be the guy that does the comparison thing, but that's all anybody said about Joe Girard. He couldn't win a big game against anybody good. What's Joe Girard's signature game? What game did he win for Syracuse that he put them on their shoulders? Uh, I don't know. The same amount that Judah Mintz has. Okay, like 
Judah has not led the team to anything significant victory wise. Not one, not one, right? Like, and again, he scores like 17, 18 against these, like against Duke, Carolina, UVA, but it's on like 20 shots. It's with four or five turnovers. And most of the points come from the foul line, which, okay, fine. Or late. Or late. Yeah, or late, or late. And, and points are points. But like, I just, that's, we're talking about progression a lot today, right? Like, can Quadir play well against a, a good opponent? Can Judah lead a team to a victory? Like, can Judah actually lead? Like, I don't think Judah really leads. I don't can, think Chris, can Chris Bell put another game together? Like, this is what yeah. this is what we've been talking that's about. The difference. The and only I'm consistent not, thing has been Malik Brown. And I'm not – listen, I'm not sitting here and I'm not bashing college, college kids. But at the end of the day, we have played enough big opponents this season not at home – and I, granted, I get some of them were also not at home. It was a neutral site. But we have played enough opponents this season that we should not be intimidated heading into a game like this. We should walk into a game and feel like we have a shot because, again, all they talked about was, oh, my God, Judah made a decision to come back to – this is what – not. I'm not saying us. I'm saying this is what college basketball world, like analysts, people who cover this shit for years – this is what they said. Judah Mintz coming back to Syracuse, that's a massive thing. So it's not, no, So now at the end of the day, now show me. Show me why you came back and show me what yeah. you can do on a big stage on ESPN at noon on a Saturday and lead us to a victory. And I'll I'll shut up. I'll shut up. I'll come out of here and I'll say I, <laughs> I said what I said can. and I'll shut up. But like I'm not, I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying he hasn't. Like I'm not I'm not saying he's not capable. I'm just saying he hasn't. And he's had a lot of opportunities and we'll see. We'll see. Like, I'm not saying I want somebody else. I'm not saying that he's not good. I'm just saying he hasn't done it. This is just a, this is just a fact. This is just a known fact. Right. And one like, thing, and one thing done that it. I mentioned, I know, I think we, I, we kind of talked um, during the Duke game, obviously I was sitting in Krause hospital with a newborn, but we kind of talked uh, <laughs> during the Duke game, but that was a game where we're like, Judah seems to be trying to get his teammates involved a lot early and not kind of looking for a shot. And like it ended up hurting Syracuse at the end. Right. I I think Judah needs to come out and from tip, be aggressive, set a tone, set a tone, not just for you, but set a tone for your team, drive to the rim, get fall, do something and send, like get your team to a point where you're like, we're here. Like, be a leader, right? And, like, maybe he's not – maybe that's not who he is. Maybe he's a shy guy. Maybe he's not a leader. But, like, go out there and set a tone. Set – like, take it to the rim, fucking dunk or do something and be like, yo, this is, we're here, right? Like, they, these guys look up to you. You may not be a leader at the end of the day, but these guys look – they want to be where you are. So, now, take them there. I, I would not consider you to be shy. But – um, <laughs> Not shy, but, like, not, not he's the not. Leader. He's not the rock. He's not the. It's hitting the fan, get behind me kind of guy. Yeah, he ain't that. Like, and that's in that's no. You can't. Nobody can just. You can't dispute that. Like, he's just not that dude. Like, he's not. He's not the foxhole guy. Okay, he's not the guy who you're like. I trust you to pull us out of this. Like, it. He's not. Um, I don't think he's really the guy that can rally the troops. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, is he the most talented player on the floor? Yeah, he probably, yeah, sure. All right. He is. But again, he's just, that's just not, that's not his, it's just not who he It's not, it's not his natural jam. Like, so you made, I, so you made a comment there that I hear a lot, right? And you kind of were hesitant to answer your own question for a minute when you said, is he the best player on the floor? Right. And like potential wise, yes. Yeah. Yes, he has the enormous potential, mm -hmm. right? But like, at the at a point, you have to show it, right? And it can't be one game. Like you had a great game this year against LSU, right? Great game. You scored thirty two points or something like that. Led Syracuse to a, at the time a big victory. Not so much now, but like now, do that against a team like you mentioned against the North Carolina or. Like, like you said, this is our low. Like, we have a ten percent chance, according to Ken Palm, to win this game. This is the lowest chance, like the 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 lowest game left on our schedule that yeah. we have a projected win. 
So, like, do something about it. Go out there and play. Yes, best, maybe player, best potential, whatever on the floor. Uh, But he's not the one who impacts winning the most. He's third. Like, he's behind Quadir and Malik impact winning more yeah, than just like there's no like and and it might not be fair but like when chris bell plays well he impacts winning more than judah does too i and like, like listen if like, we want if we want to talk progression and things like that since that's a, the the road that we've been on so far for this game <laughs> i want to see i and i'm not calling again i'm not calling guys out but i want to see jj play better uh I, I just don't think we're going to get much more out of JJ this year. I think we, I think like, he is who he is. The best year. game is it at Syracuse so far this season was at Georgetown. By far, I think, I think that was his best yeah, game. Yeah, I, I think next year we're going to see a big leap for JJ, but I don't think I don't think we're going to see much different this year. Like he'll have a couple 12, 13 point games. He'll have a couple seven, eight point games. He'll have a couple games where he hits a three or two and scores like fifteen. I I, I don't think he's going to be like a focal point at all this year. Um, I think next year is when he kind of steps into that a little bit more, um, which is fine. I don't, I don't know that he needs to be that on this team. If Judah does his job, I don't think JJ needs Judah. He just kind of needs to be like a supporting role that plays hard and makes good decisions and still attacks the rim. Like that's what he needs to do. Like that's he didn't he do that against BC though. No. And I think part of it was, I, it's hard for everybody to play well at the same time. Like, if Chris yeah, Bell's yeah, playing, yeah, if Chris Bell's playing yeah. well, like that means less shots are going to go to JJ, right? Like if Judah's playing well, like that means less shots will go to Chris Bell, right? If if JT's playing well, like then like those like it's just hard to give everybody you know 10, 12 shots. So, um, which again, that's what good teams do a lot of times as well. Like you know, different guys step up and different guys play well. Um, but I think that was part of. I think that was part of the BC, part of the lack of aggression against BC as well was that uh, you know Quadier's playing so well, Chris Bell's playing so well, um, Malik's playing so well. So a lot of those kind of points, like the ball's in Quadier's hands more now, like because they trust a, him more with the ball. But that's that's a good thing to happen in, in Syracuse's case it right is. now. Yeah, the fact that Quadier and Malik have taken that leap, and yeah, I agree. Like that's a good thing for Syracuse, and I know like. Obviously, you mentioned like uh, some guys may not get a butt. Like JJ only played 24 minutes against BC because of the way Quadir was playing, and Judah ended up finishing the game. And Chris Bell had a great game, and Justin was kind of holding his own for the most part until the last five minutes. But like that, like guys are going to have to like at the end of the day, basketball is a team sport. And yeah. Some guys, I mean, you just got to ride. And, like, you may not have the same five that closes every game. It's going to be based not. on the flow of the game and who's playing well in that game. Um, one interesting thing that I'll throw out there, um, and do not quote me on this, um, I do not have any inside information whatsoever, but seeing a lot of um, photos from Syracuse's practice the past couple of days, um, obviously certain guys wear certain jerseys when they scrimmage. Uh, you have blue and you have orange. Um a lot of the photos I saw, Benny Williams was running with the, uh, was running with Judah, JJ, Chris, and Malik a lot in the last two days. Um, don't take too much into that. Uh, maybe they're just trying to figure out lineups that kind of gel with each other at the end of the day. Um, but yeah. I mean, maybe with Naheem not being out there, maybe they could try to go Benny over Justin just to try to get a little bit more size. But I mean, who knows? Think- Benny day. has Benny has I mean Benny has to play more now like period like if Malik's going to be starting for probably the rest of the year or a while like I mean Benny has to get more minutes because that moves Benny into that backup four, four five. or five spot like probably more four so like you know when Malik comes out Benny has to play and sometimes Benny will play four and Malik will play five depending on yeah like you said like maybe more athletic teams. I mean, we'll see. I mean, we'll see. They, they get paid the millions of dollars to make those choices. So, um, I don't get paid anything. So, um, nope. there's that, but, um, all right. You got anything else on Carolina before we get out of here? Uh, I don't, I, like you said, they're top 10 defense, top 15 offense, top 10 team in college basketball, 
they're probably playing as well right now as any team in college basketball. They, with all the upsets this week in the top five, I mean, North Carolina could move up to the top five, truthfully. Um, yeah. But, I mean, my mind tells me Syracuse loses by 12, 13. Um, but, like, show me something. Um, I, like I mentioned earlier, I've said it four or five times. You've played a lot of big, big name teams this year, right? Like, what have we learned? Like coming back from Maui, it was okay. We kind of went on this run where we won what five of six, and we lost. Like our only loss was Virginia, and then we went to Duke, and everybody's like, okay, the first half we were right there, and then the second half it got away. Like, yeah. and we put like like I mentioned, I would love to see this team be tied or close at the five minute mark and kind of see what happens. Give yourself a chance to win. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, like you said, Syracuse is one thing that's been going for them all year is turning teams over. Um, even the teams like Boston college, who was ranked 11th in the country at not turning it over, turn it over 22 times. So like, I don't know, maybe that's Syracuse's recipe. I know we kind of talked off air about it a little bit, how playing sloppy and things like that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think I don't think Syracuse has a chance in this game, truthfully, without JD, JJ and Judah. Um, they can't play like they did against BC. Um, I would love for Malik to get 19 and Chris Bell to get 20 again in a game like tomorrow. Um, but I just they they need them in this game to kind of weather the storm. Like North Carolina is going to go on a run at some point, and how do you answer that run? Do they do they stretch the lead to 13, 14, and then it's an uphill climb? Or can you kind of get a bucket and stop the bleeding? So there's little things I'm going to be looking for in this game. Um, obviously, at the bottom of my heart, I would love a win. That would be a great thing to start off a weekend. But I just don't know if that happens. Yeah, I, I think Carolina's guards are too experienced. You got R.J. Davis. You got Cadeau. You got Cormac Ryan. I think their guards are too experienced. They won't turn it over 22 times like B.C. did. Um once and and again, Boston College had the 150 some ranked defense against in the in uh, coming to the dome, and now you got Carolina who's top 10. I think Carolina's defense is a little too much for Syracuse, and since they don't turn it over, uh, Syracuse has to score in the half court against them, and they have Baycott. I, I I think it's a terrible terrible matchup, honestly. Like I like Duke, I like the Duke matchup better than the Carolina matchup. I think, and, and I say I, this, I, think, I, I don't I don't like it at all. I say this respectfully because I know he hasn't played great this year, but I think it. I think it's a more favorable, not favorable, but like less question mark matchup if Naheem is healthy and in this game because at least he can kind of match up. Like Armando's not going to take you out to the three point line, hmm. and yeah. like he can at least stand down there. And I'm not saying he's going to stop Baycott, but that's five falls you have. That's a guy that you can kind of be physical with a little bit, but like yeah. It's just tough now having Malik at the five. Like, it kind of changes the whole thing. But well, I mean, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it's it's working right now. So, but I said that about Quentin Post. I thought it was going to be one of those games, and Malik held his own, and he kind of yeah. frustrated him. So, like, and again, it's the, this is the first banger kind of big guy that they have to go against. So that that's going to be interesting to see. I mean, but really, at the end of the day, um, I've talked to a lot of people recently about Syracuse and this season. Um, the one thing that everybody has to remember is this team is still very young, like very young. Like we play, what, seven sophomores, um, eight sophomores maybe. And then you got, I mean, now that Naheem's out, but I think it's seven sophomores and one junior. But even Benny hasn't played. Like you look at Benny's first two years at Syracuse, like Benny finally figured it out in a three-game stretch for the first time in his career at the end of the season last year. So, like, yeah. you don't really – and then, you like you mentioned, you look at North Carolina, I think they got two seniors and three grad guys. So, like, mm -hmm. it's kind of one of those games where it's experience versus not experience. Um, but, obviously, a lot of these guys played in that game against North Carolina last year for Syracuse. J.J. played against North Carolina last year when he was at Notre Dame. So, like, none of this should be new to these guys. Um, but we'll see what happens, I guess. Yeah. I don't think that's an issue. I don't, I don't think intimidation or whatever, or not or like Carolina being Carolina is the issue. I just think the issue is that they're better than us. Yeah. So. Yeah. A hundred percent. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> saying yeah. like to a point where like, 
it's like you've seen a lot of growth from a, a couple guys this year, right? And like I know I I know you're looking at this season, but like I'm looking at what could be next year as well. Like obviously I, I can't, still in you this can't do that though. You can't look at next season because you have no freaking clue what the roster is going to be. So like it's well, like I this is the the three guys I'm looking at. I don't see any three of them leaving. So well, maybe. <laughs> so maybe, probably, but I like mean, we'll see. It's just you know. I you know want, it's the way college basketball is now. Who knows? Really like I mean, you this is all you got. You got to live in a moment <laughs> at this point. Like your roster yeah. construction has to be like right now. Like because you just it's don't tough. Know. It's tough. Yeah, it's just a different. You live in a world where it's tough. And like Quadir kind of made a, a a point, I think it was after the BC game, where he said uh, his quote, and I, I, I don't know what it was exactly, but it was along the lines of, um, I waited my turn, um, and now I finally got my opportunity, and I'm going to thrive in it. So like yeah. it's one of those guys where he's just saying, I didn't run from the fire, and – I worked my ass off to get better. And I mean, it's recently it's been showing. I mean, out of the last five, six games outside of the Duke game, he's been from that. He's been one of the best players on the court for Syracuse. So, absolutely. Hopefully, absolutely. he can try to take that into a game. Like you mentioned, like, let's see that against the North Carolina. Let's see you play like that in a game like this. So, we'll see what happens, but we shall. All right. Well, we're going to sign out of here. Um, Syracuse, Carolina at noon. We'll see what happens. Um, there's a reason they play the game, right? There's a reason they play the game. A lot of crazy stuff has happened this week in college hoops. No reason to think that Syracuse can't find a way to get it done either, um, regardless of what the numbers or the the folks around the world kind of kind of say. So we'll see what happens. Um, we will check back in with you guys after that Carolina game at some point, we'll give you a breakdown, and then uh, give you some preview on Pitt, who, uh, where Syracuse goes to on Tuesday. So a quick turnaround from the Carolina game to Pittsburgh. All right, that's it from us. On behalf of Nick Peckham, we're out of here. And uh, thanks for your time, guys. See you next time.